Now, for most people who are coming into the new truth, they they still don't really understand how Garvey could be controlled opposition. And I'll explain that. But first, let's look at W.E.B. Du Bois. W.E.B. Du Bois came on to the NAACP and he was Massapol champion for like the first five decades of Massapol. That just means he was the top Negro in the country. He was the top intellectual Negro in the country. You see how that works? Dubois and his friends were being propagated as black intellectuals, as the front runners of this new black Harlem Renaissance with guys like Langston Hughes. When I say Zionists, I'm talking about Jews. Jews who were claiming Israel. Now we haven't even gotten into who was pushing Garvey just yet. We're gonna stick on Dubois just for a second longer because we need to understand the entertainment business. We need to understand books back then. We need to understand how radio worked, how music worked, how poetry worked. When black people don't have a voice, when black people are literally just out of slavery, newly free, yet segregated, yet these industries were starting to grow here in this country. So what did these Zionist whites do? They said, before these niggas get out of hand, we need to make sure that we control anything that comes out of their community. Essentially, that would keep them subservient to the much, much bigger picture, which obviously they didn't have a paintbrush on. But if you can build all of these black communities based around art and literature and education, and then you're able, you're able to build these institutions and then you're able to instruct these niggas on what exactly they should be doing and who exactly they should be doing. When W.E.B. Du Bois went to the NAACP, it's never been controlled by black people. Their first black director wasn't until 50 years later. Du Bois didn't have any control at the NAACP only whites did. Joel Spingarn was an FBI agent who literally reported back to the FBI what W.E.B. Du Bois was telling him. Now the NAACP has the Joel Spingarn medal. People still win the medal for an agent. The Spingarn medal is like an honor now. But he was the agent that sold out W.E.B. Du Bois. And I swear the NAACP will throw Du Bois picture on every cover. Moving along to Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey. Many people would ask the question, how could Marcus Garvey be controlled opposition? Born in Jamaica, he was the leader of the Pan-Africanist movement. He founded the Black Star Line. The Black Star Line was a shipping and passenger line which promoted the African diaspora. He promoted the idea that blacks in America should return to their ancestral homeland, which Garvey said was Africa. Throughout Garvey's life, he had more opportunity than the average Negro. Throughout his life, he was able to work abroad, working in Central America, and then eventually going to Europe. One thing people will find interesting is that Garvey attended the prestigious Birkbeck College in London. Alma mater to some of the most influential people in world history, including prime ministers and Nobel Prize winners as well. To some people's surprise, they may find out that Garvey, in fact, was a Christian. Indeed, Garvey was a Pan-Africanist Christian. 
one must detail Garvey's affinity for Europe and especially Ireland when recounting his career. With close ties to the Roman Catholic Church, and some of the most influential people of the UK hierarchy. When considering if Garvey could literally be controlled opposition, one must look at the platform of the UNIA, in particularly the Back to Africa movement. As someone who studied scripture, Marcus Garvey believed in the Messiah and the New Testament. During Garvey's career, he never acknowledged that the black Americans were indeed the children of Israel. In fact, he propagated the idea of black Americans being ancestrally from Africa. This theory itself falls under Darwinism and the out of Africa theory, and furthermore promotes the idea of evolution and heliocentrism. As far as problems for the establishment goes, Marcus Garvey's movement was a much bigger problem than W.E.B. Du Bois' Harlem Renaissance. Garvey had over one million followers and had an active economy of black people to contribute to his movement. Garvey was a Pan-Africanist Christian with an affinity for Europe and especially Ireland. And these would be the same Irish who had violent and contentious relationships with the free blacks of the Northeast. Since the Civil War, blacks in the North had begun taking the menial jobs from Irish immigrants who had a reputation for being drunken, violent, and lazy. These Irish would even stoop so low as to burn an orphanage of colored children to the ground during the New York draft riots. These riots left over 5,000 blacks homeless. These crimes perpetuated by poor whites, mostly Irish, who could not afford the $300 get out of draft free card. They blamed blacks for taking their jobs, yet Garvey named his UNIA headquarters Liberty Hall in honor of the Irish Revolution. An odd choice for a Pan-Africanist who spent more time in Europe than his supposed Aboriginal homeland. For a black man during this time, Marcus Garvey had the unique opportunity to travel the world, yet at no time during his life has it ever been legitimately reported that Garvey spent any time or even set foot on the continent of Africa. Coincidentally, his career rival W.E.B. Du Bois died in Ghana. Both men never deviating from their Darwinistic belief. that the aboriginal origins of blacks in this country rested in Africa instead of here in the Americas.